Same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what should I do to retain my chance of winning when I get ego by, by low GM Zarya's on my team for stealing the Zarya or going Diva Hogsake when they're going Zarya? I mean, there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. Just, just rest in the fact that the other low masters uh, off tanks on the enemy team are dealing with that too. So you just have to be better than them. Now you're not always going to be playing up against uh, you know low master off tanks, but just be patient. Be patient. If your goal is to be GM, climb, winning one game is not going to matter. Your goal is not to be 3650 or 3700. Your goal is to be 3900, 4K. Right, so you've got bigger goals. Um, I mean, there's just not a lot you can do. Not in, not in the space of one game. Duo with a main tank? I mean, unironically, that would be helpful. Okay. Hypothetically speaking, if I was making a Hanzo guide, what would be the key concepts and things to include my Drilla? Okay, basically, I mean, you just saw the Hanzo guide widget. Like, I just went very in detail. Angle control, utilizing your Sonic and Stormbow. I don't know why I just cursived that. Sonic and Stormbow to win those flanks and or leverage those flanks. In other words, you can, if there's somebody on the flank, you can use Sonic and Stormbow to beat the crap out of them and take the flank away from them. Or if that flank is uncontested, you can then use Sonic and Stormbow on the enemy team from your position. Um, so you can like Sonic them to line up your own headshots. So you can Stormbow the enemy backline, lots of things like that. But it's, it's mostly like you saw, like we saw in the last Vodery, putting yourself in the right position and then just kind of shooting. Like unlike heroes like um, Genji or Tracer, or Sombra even, there's not a lot, like once you're in the position, you just kind of exist and pressure happens. Um, the thing that's tricky with Hanzo is, uh, you know, getting in the right position and then actually kind of using your abilities in that position in the proper order. Um, but it's not like once once your Sonic bows up, once you're on the angle, it's just clicking heads. So uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was watching this IOSX VOD for research, came across this really counterintuitive clip to do with high ground aiming. I, IOSX advised the Hanzo to actually drop off of high ground and take a horizontal flank instead of flanking shots would be easier to do. Okay, so let's look at this. So I'm not going to hammer time this whole VOD, but we'll look at this particular instance. Zone, but that's kind of vague. But yeah. Now Wait. Why did you send me the wrong timestamp, you moron? 4225? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yeah. so, the, so the main two benefits that you want to think about is that for one, it gives you angles on enemies that are that you wouldn't otherwise get because they might be behind a shield, and it is safer for you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there's also one big downside. It makes it significantly more difficult to land shots. Because yeah. if you look at this angle, the Anna, for example, she can move around in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. Right? She can move down, left, up, right. But if you're horizontal with her, then she can't move down and up. Because down yeah. and up are now back and forth, and walking back and forth doesn't affect your aim here, does it? Yeah. So by being horizontal with her, do you see how it becomes much, much easier to land shots? Yeah. So in this situation, you actually need to be cocky, and the correct play for you would have been to drop down and get a uh, lunge towards these boxes, and then peek shoot around these boxes. Or go through Mega. Yeah, it does make, yeah, okay, yeah, it does make So, sense. so I'm just going to stop there. I don't disagree exactly, but you also have to understand that by giving up that high ground, you're also, it's not just about, oh, it's better, but it's, it's, you're significantly less safe when you give up the high ground. <clears throat> so if you have a, a good, safe off angle that's level, so it's slightly easier to land shots, sure. But those are not often the case at Overwatch. <clears throat> often those lateral angles are a lot more at risk. And I, and I think depending on the, 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 the severity of the angle, <clears throat> a lot of high grounds, it's not that much harder. It's not that much harder. And sometimes the high ground angle, because you're on high ground, you're able to get to a better angle in the first place. And remember what we saw on Third Point Hollywood or Route 66 on the last file that we reviewed over, how the Hanzo being on high ground and missing most of his shots still did more than he would have even on a more conservative angle because it made everybody look up and away and it scared them away. That's the value right there. Even if you don't hit all your shots, you're still doing a lot more. So I don't disagree, but I don't fully agree for sure. Because it's the pressure that you get from that position, the threat of kills that are now available to you that weren't available in the other position that scares people. 
Uh, I mean, <laughs> I swear, Neapolitan. I, I, I swear. Uh, ah, please, please, please stop. Please stop. Can you explain the overall concept positioning with Ana? Can you do one of those drawings that you do that they help a lot? I mean, I guess so. My, my drawings help people? No way. My handwriting actually helps people. I'm, I'm calling my mom. She's gonna be so, so proud. Okay, uh, corner, cover, right? So if I'm like here, you should always be cover. Like it's a 0 0.5 second rule with Ana, just like what it is with most heroes, right? Um, <clears throat> with Ana, you're positioned mostly to maintain LOS off of your main tank. This is your main tank, okay? The big bulky guy or girl, okay? Your main tank, all right? You're putting pressure, or even if you don't have a main tank, an off tank, you're putting pressure, keeping LOS onto your tanks whenever you possibly can, okay? So maybe it's two off tanks, a main tank, whatever, all right? <clears throat> the only thing that Ana does that's kind of cute is when fights actually break out, you'll occasionally see Ana do, Ana's do this. When fights break out, briefly, do this, or they'll do this, or they'll do this. They'll do a quick flank, a quick angle, and look for sleep, or usually look for a nade. Because the value of that burst of nade is worth breaking off LOS off your tanks for half a second. Now do not do long flanks 99% of the time. Don't go around flanking on and killing back lines, please. That's just almost never the play but it is perfectly acceptable to look for these slight off angles to get behind shields, to, nano, to, to nade more people behind shields, and to also not get your nades body blocked by your team. You'll have better LOS than what you actually need to nade. So we went over this in the recent Platinum Ana video. You can look it up on YouTube, uh, where we talk about keep LOS in your tanks, stay near cover, keep a little distance between yourself and your team, a dependence on the enemy composition, um, and then go for quick little angles and flanks. The only other thing I'd say is against dive, try and find a buddy, but again, don't play up inside your team. It's sometimes almost better to play by yourself, but with cover and with a good angle, good uh, good high ground, than it is to be inside of your team against dive. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but your team's peel isn't worth sacrificing all of your positioning fundamentals for. You can't body block me anymore. Not if you're not if you're not full HP, but if your Ryan is 450 HP or 500 HP or your or 480 or your Hog is there or your McCree is you know 200. 13 HP, they can body block it. So that's something that you want to avoid because sometimes it's just not worth healing that extra little bit, right? No, but you are right though. It is it is worth pointing that out. You're not stupid. <clears throat> I mean, you are, but for other reasons. <laughs> Sorry, how, uh, how can I help a less confident player be confident in himself and don't play scary when he is matched against Smurfs? High rank players, for more details, he tends to stack and main tank when he is matched against Smurfs instead of trying to fight them for angle slings. Um, I mean, just be the, the honest. The, the honest answer is that when, remember we went over today and the the Hansa vod where people were fighting for angles and flanks, and we it wasn't requiring us to actually beat them in the duel to win. Thanks for making accessible and quality content. Hey, appreciate it, Shadow. Thanks so much for the sub. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it, mate. Uh, you're very welcome. We're working at it. We're working at it. Um, but you fighting on angles and flanks does not mean. You're egoing. It does not mean you're going for duels. It just means that you're putting out pressure. If I'm playing Widow into an, a Widow that I know is better than me, I'm not going to stand behind shields. I'm going to take angles and flanks and threaten the duel. I might not even take the duel just to scare her, just to scare her team. And because I know that even if I never take a duel with the enemy Widow, I'm going to do more on the enemy team not the widow by taking angles and flanks even if i never once look for the duel i'll still do more as a widow so for you your, your friend getting egoed on a flank is more likely because there's fewer things in between you and the enemy team in other words if there's here's my Ryan shield and the enemy Ryan shield and i'm over here and i'm hanzo and he's over there and he's hanzo if i'm stacking behind shield yeah there's less of a chance that i'm gonna get headshot by the enemy hanzo right but there's a significantly higher chance that we're just gonna flat out lose the game. And that Hanzo is gonna be completely free and just flank and kill six. So it's not about the, the, the holding flanks and it's not about beating the Hanzo in the duel. It's about, hey, I'm gonna Sonic you and I'm gonna shoot you a little bit, like shoot at you every now and then, not peek you and I'll shoot your team. Because even if I, let's say I don't even wanna take the, let's say I go take a flank over here. Well, still good. 
because now I'm still doing more than I would be behind Rangel. I can avoid the duel entirely and still do more on an opposite flank. Oh, he's on that flank. Ugh, I don't want to take that duel. I'm going to go over here. But don't stack main. Don't do it. Most, I mean, obviously, I'm speaking very broadly, right? But in, in, in an example that you give me there. Um, I mean, you guys remember, it's actually, it's, it's actually pretty common knowledge here in the pro scene that if you're not comfortable on tracer mechanically, sometimes coaches will actually have you mark the enemy tracer. So in other words, in professional Overwatch, uh, it's actually easier a lot of times to mark, if you're not comfortable on tracer, to duel the enemy tracer than it is to try and force backline. Because just simply by keeping the enemy tracer busy, you don't even have to try and kill her. Just keep her busy and survive. It's actually not super difficult. And you get consistent value out of it. So in a way, actually tying up or stalling or threatening or, or stalemating enemy DPS is actually easier than trying to carry in other ways. Um, I'll be your tracer player. You're the next Dante. At, 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 oh, the only Dante? Why not striker? Honestly, striker's a peasant. Let's go above that. Let's say, let's say bacon world, bacon versus world is that's just that's just you make striker look like a peasant. You're welcome, Dragonfly. Uh, first ask on stream while you did an analogy with Age of Empire about Diva Mobility. Second attempt to get an answer. What do you think about map control in Age of Empires versus Overwatch? Now <laughs> I am a complete noob when it comes to Age of Empire. I know more about Age of Empires than I can play, um, but I don't even know very much. So my thoughts with Age of Empire map control is I look at Age of Empires Overwatch as you fight for positions that get you kills. For Age of Empires, you fight for resources that get you kills. In other words, the gold, you guys may not know what this is, but the stone, um, the tree lines, this is a great choke for me to defensively build my base. You basically are fighting for resources to win Age of Empires. So the way I would, if I were to simplify Age of Empires from a very noob standpoint, and I, 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 I for any game that I will ever play, I pull the same things from Overwatch to it as well. But my noob understanding is I, I suspect that fighting for map control in regards to the resources is the macro game, the real macro game of Age of Empires. It's not being the first person to hit Castle Age necessarily. Uh, it's not being the first person to hit Feudal. It's about properly taking fights that are advantageous to you, fighting dirty, right? And winning the map control in terms of the resources and the parts of the map that you control. Just controlling the map arbitrarily doesn't matter. But if I control this gold pile, I'm defending this wood pile, that's ultimately what wins you the fight. <clears throat> that's my what i suspect again i I'm, I'm i don't play i haven't played that game in a long time i never really was very good at it um unironically if i ever do move on to another game than overwatch the first name on the list is probably going to be age of empires age of empires roast reviews i mean you never know <clears throat> if i ever did move on that's probably where i would end up going um how do you play ball in a ball sigma tracer ashton bring mirror so you what you're going to do is you're going to try and disrupt slash dive the backline so that's sigma ash trace uh zen brig but to get there you might have to do a little bit of dueling okay and i treat dueling as like those one and one of the enemy ball one and one the enemy tracer getting harmony orb getting so you want to get resources from your backline to beat their flankers you beat their flankers so you can go to their backline now, you might not always have to duel their tra their flankers to get to backline. If, if you've got a free path to the Zenyatta Brig, go for it. And this is where the important, the second important part comes into. The timing, right? If your Zenyatta and Brig and Ash and Sigma aren't doing Jack, then you should not be doing Jack either. And Tracer as well. You want to be synchronizing your pressure with your Tracer. So whenever your Zenyatta can start spamming their Sigma, their Zen, is fighting, is dueling their Tracer, maybe they're diving your backline, that's your key. When your backline is in a position to spam or, or do something, or your Tracer's in a position to do something, that's your key to either pursue a duel or to disrupt or dive. And that's a very, very abbreviated, truncated, if you will, uh, <clears throat> way of doing it. Do you know any rewards, punishments to give a team-specific player? Um, 
I think you could do things like, I don't know how frequently you do team VOD reviews, but you could be like, hey guys, like let's, let's today, like we did such a good job last scrim block with focusing. We don't even have to do a long VOD review today. We're gonna do, you normally we do 35 minutes today. Let's just do a 10 minute recap and let's get out of here. You know, um, you know, I've toyed with little gift card ideas that we've done before. I paid for them out of pocket sometimes, which is my wife is not happy about that. But uh, that that also works sometimes. Um, but make sure that you're rewarding um, effort, not success necessarily, because uh, ultimately effort is what gets you success. So even though success is certainly something to celebrate, you always celebrate the the effort because success is temporary. Efforts forever, right? You want to build a correlation um, between effort and something good happening like you're literally building pavlovian responses right and that's not to be weird but that's kind of like what you're going for you want them to associate success or excuse me effort with something positive and that can also be just positive words encouragement if you think a player really put in good effort let them know a kind word goes a long way um that's been I know this is ironic for you guys in chat, but I always firmly believe my relationships with my players has been my strong point as a head coach over the years. Um, my ability to be considerate and kind and keep in touch with the players. Not, not. I'm not like a great, super smart, like social engineer. I'm just saying, I just talk with my players a lot. I have a lot of good friends from teams that I've coached and I've kept close to contact and kept in touch and it's because of the time that i spent and to me that's like that goes a long way i think a lot of teams in overwatch league you hear, read my lips <laughs> i've said it again there's a lot of teams in overwatch League, a lot of coaches in overwatch league that would do a lot better if they just built better relationships with their players i'm not better strategy not big brain this just we're better friends to the players and I think it's not a coincidence that you guys, you look at Krusty and he's described as a tough, but a very a coach that's very close with his players. That's not a coincidence that he's had a lot of success, if that's really what he's like. <clears throat> Baba, that's actually a really cool idea. That's actually a really cool idea. That sounds like a great idea. Uh, do you have any advice or how to optimize for improvement when playing ranked when the other player in your role picks something that doesn't work well with the heroes you're maining? Example given, you're maining Lucio Mercy and the other support picks Lucio Mercy and Brigger you're maining. Sorry, even the other pink picks another off tank. Either you need to play something you're not looking for to practice. Um, so the, the, here's the fun thing. So you're all, like, even if you, it's not an optimal situation, you're still practicing your mechanics. The fundamentals of the hero are the same. But in a way, it's almost a good challenge. For example, if you're playing double off tank, oh man, you know, so, but you still have to take angles. In fact, it's even more important for you to take angles as Sigma if you're playing Sigma Hog because there is no main pressure at all. You're not going to win the main war at all. It's impossible. So you better find a good angle. You better find, you better like time your pressure well, right? If you're playing, you know, Lucio and the other team picks Brig, uh, yeah, you better, you better amp your heals perfectly. You better nail your boobs because you've got no healing toy around with. And yeah, your team's not going to be super happy about it. Um, like, I, and, and I, you know, for example, if you, if you picked a Zen, I wouldn't go Lucio. I'd probably go Mercy most of the time because that comp usually makes more sense than Zen Lucio. Uh, so try and flex and fill within your hero pool around what fits best. Um, but treat it as like an, an opportunity and a challenge. And ultimately, worst case scenario, your team trolls, everybody gets mad. You still had a game where you practice your mechanics and you practice your goals. And that's all that you're really looking for. Hey, Black Bishop, what's going on right? How do you play Moira and Talon Dive? Keep up, <laughs> keep up, and generally you you're gonna heal orb the dive itself. The actual dive um, sometimes rotates as well. You're gonna heal orb, and that is it's like a preemptive like you heal orb. It follows it. You dive. Your teams are taking damage. The heal orb reaches reaches it. Try and say fade if you can, but if you have to fade to keep up with the rotation, that's fine as well. So generally you'll be able to keep up with amped Lucio speed, and then fade for safety. And then um, rarely damage orb. I think that's actually a misconception. I think damage orb, unless it's like one specific target that you absolutely have to annihilate, because the damage orb value, um, generally when you get when you're playing Mo Talon dive. So this is again chat. Winston, Diva, Sombra, Tracer, Moira, Lucio. Sometimes a Reaper, Sombra. Um, if you're playing like enemy comps, most comps against Moira, uh, Talon dive. Excuse me, split up, right? And that's normal. You're trying to split up to take angles on that really aggressive brawl. 
which means your deep your damage orb actually loses significant value because your team stays relatively stacked maybe with like one offing here or there um but you your your, your damage orb loses significant value because it's going to get maybe hit one person and it's going to bounce and it's gone um and unless that 30 40 damage that you're going to get from the damage orb is literally beyond crucial i would generally heal her because you're going to get more value out of the healer in that situation um now if you're talking talon dive mirror different story in that situation um you know he like resource management is important um orbs in general in the talon dive mirror become very difficult because they get eaten literally off of cooldown by the enemy diva and it sometimes it gets to the point where you might actually even heal orb your own sombra on an offing or damage orb the enemy sombra on an offing i'm not joking you actually will solo damage orb a sombra just to get rid of her because you know your orbs are gonna get eaten instantaneously anyway um this is pretty advanced stuff though the tanks jump out of range and more heals in the fight starts well then your lose who's not doing a very good job and uh, you need to consider uh uh you know fading in for it generally i mean you can watch talent dive at the pro level watch dallas play it please don't watch other teams play it i think the other teams suck um they they keep pretty well within their memes in terms of like jump tank they don't overextend very often it's a very fast composition but they they, they don't they don't leave them where too far behind you're a diamond off tank player that can comfortably scream around mid diamond but i find myself have trouble staying in diamond constantly during a 2.8 is this a mental issue could be or is this a problem that other people have too oh it's a very common problem the problem is this is that your place in a team does not generally reflect accurately on your place as an individual player so you could be a exceptional shot caller ult tracker you have great synergy with the team that you're playing or you just decent synergy with the team that you're playing and so you're able to compete against less coordinated less synergized teams um then you get into ranked where the synergy is kind of thrown out the window the communication kind of thrown out the window and you're left just with your raw game sense your positioning your mechanics your cooling usage and you just can't cut it right so you need to look at this not as oh i'm a diamond player i'm just not no you need to look at it as i kind of suck at cooldown usage or positioning or mechanics and i'm making up for it with my synergy my listening my communication and that's not going to cut it in ranked now you can definitely go oh i'm going to start shot calling in ranked or i'm going to start communicating more in ranked um and that, and that could work uh, if that's something that you want to work on or improve on. But if you just want to get better at your hero, you need to figure out like what's keeping you back. Like what are you not performing up to snuff on and fix that because it is very normal because co coordinated play, like I've seen many teams, even contenders. Um, heck, I've coached players and contenders that were like 4.3K. 4.4 like at, at, at the moment we're stuck like they were not because for for context 4.6 4.5 like that's normal for contenders right that's that's and it's only like 200 300 sr that's significantly more because of the, the way the bell curve works like they're but they were like mechanics were washed they're 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 sloppy but they brought that something into the team that provided that much more value now that's that shouldn't be an excuse for them but it's just an explanation main support and flex support main support is essentially more of the non aim heroes with uh support uh lucio mercy and brig usually and the flex support is more of the aim heroes zen on a bap and there's some bleeding back and forth between them because some compositions demand that you have two support second aim in other words double shield was bap zen so people looked at bap zen they're like oh this sucks which one of those supports demands more aim zen okay let's put our flex support on zen because zen is harder to aim with so he's already got practice on that and then sorry lucio players sorry mercy and brig players you're going to have to learn how to play bat because his aim is a little less hard that's kind of how it is so main support just means that you're playing that generally playing that role of heroes my friend told me double bubble plays more like floats instead of regular drive how true is that uh regular drive yes that's true um because double bubble generally splits a little less than dive uh, with her brawl core um there's and with the inclusion of zarya that includes the brawlier style element of our winston goes in we have a flank uh, which is the dive orientation uh but then our zarya brig on are looking for value from cooldowns looking from pressure so it's not exactly like floats at all but there is some floats elements in it yeah and again for context guys floats is winston goats the old goats composition back in the day floats plays basically your winston dives in hard backline with bubble and your core runs in and tries to find value 
What about Moira? Great question. So Moira is generally a hero that's played with Lucio in either brawl or dive composition, very fast-based compositions. And because you don't want your flex support player on Lucio because he has no practice or she has no practice on Lucio, you generally put them on Moira. So even though Moira doesn't require aim, you you don't want your uh, you don't want your flex support player having to learn Lucio, a new hero he's never played before uh, or she's never played before. You'd rather just throw them on Moira, who is relatively easy to pick up and learn. But like, let's say you were to play a Moira Zen comp. I mean, it sounds terrible, but like, let's say you found a way to make Moira Zen. It's the great. You'd want your main support on Moira because Moira is very easy to learn. Zen is not and more aim dependent. So you want your flex support playing Zen because he's or she again is already good at Zen. Uh, okay, let's look at this. Why would you use all three packs on one target? Okay, why would you use all three packs on one target? Let's try to figure this out. Enemy territory and that Graviton Surge comes in pretty late in the day. It's not really enough. Um, and a dream. He's able to get away, but for how they're up one, run him down eventually deep in enemy up one, up two. I mean, I think using three packs there was definitely a hard feed. I think one or two would have been fine. Because remember, pack doesn't stack in volume, it stacks in duration. So if you stack pack twice, you're not healing for twice as much. You're healing for twice as long. So overall, the healing is double, but it, it doesn't increase the, oh no, I'm going to help save you, right? Um, packing three times there just means that, what is that? It's going to be a six second HOT for something like 450 healing, something like that. I, I do think that's a feat. I do think that's a feat. I think one, uh, certainly one pack, maybe two for the a four second duration or what, whatever it is exactly. I don't know what it is exactly. Would have been worth it. But save that one pack just in case Rappel needs it, just in case Doha needs it. Because like, look at the look at the situation right now. Doha definitely could use a pack, but we don't have one. You know, does was Sparkle saveable as well if we'd had a pack? I mean, I don't listen. Look, like we can see Sparkle, but yeah, it's a mistake. I mean, I'm not sold that Jexy's Brig is exactly somebody that I should be. You should be looking at. I think Jexy's Brig is kind of shaky, to be honest. Um, but uh, I mean, there you go. You can see it right there. That is a mistake. <clears throat> no, no. Here's the thing, Chad. Is um, Overwatch League players are phenomenal. They're much better than you or I are playing the game, but they make mistakes. And they make mistakes a lot. And it, it is never rude or egotistical to question things, right? How do we... Um, optimally, yes. You would pack once, wait a second or so. Pack again, wait a second or so. Pack again if you really needed to. That way, just in case they get bursted down and die, you still have those other packs available. Yes, that technically makes sense. Sometimes you'll see double or triple packing when the person that you're packing is going to get outside of your LOS where you cannot heal them. So it's preemptively packing them for the next four or five seconds, but you don't see that as much anymore. Um, Hog got buffed. What tanks do I play when somebody insta-locks Hog on my team? How do I play those tanks with Hog? Well, Hog is a, like, don't think, just think about what kind of range does Hog want to play? Probably more spammy. Uh, he does do more damage up close, but he doesn't benefit, his right click is a ranged uh, uh, opportunity. He does no shields, no armor, which means he bleeds ult charge up close, and his hook is doesn't get any benefit from being up close. So Hog is a more spammy hero fundamentally. So you look at the more spammy tanks or tanks that function well in spammier style comps, Orisa, Sigma, Ball. And those are the ones I'd probably play with. You could fit Azari in there as well. Um, Ryan, not so much. Winston, not so much. Diva, not so much. Um, but I would pick one of those, pick the ones that you're more comfortable with or the ones that the map fits better. If it's a great ball map, go ball. If it's a great Sigma map, go Sigma. If you've got uh, a more brawl style of composition, you can, you can work around that. So to complement his his more spammy flank play style, and even if your team does, if your if your teammate doesn't play it the way he's supposed to be playing, it, or she's supposed to be playing it, but whatever. Opinion is an end of season rank. Um, I, I, here's the thing: whenever people complain about quality of ranked play, I never complain. I never disagree. In other words, end of season rank. Oh yeah, I'm sure it's way more trolly. But people saying, "Oh, I plummeted 450 SR." I don't know about that. You just suck. <laughs> like people, if people, if you don't want to play end of season ranked because it's not going to be fun having a troll like every other game, 
that's fine. But if you're scared to play end of season ranked because you're scared of dropping SR, then then you need to stop smoking the weed, okay? Because there's literally no not a, in, there's a there's a more likely that something unlucky will happen to you or the enemy team, which makes the quality of play lower, but does not should not as a whole affect your SR. There is a chance that you get unlucky. There is a higher chance that you get unlucky, but there's also a higher chance of you getting lucky as well. And ultimately, if the end of rank really doesn't matter, then why are you caring if you, if you drop 300 SR anyway? Who cares? Maybe you get really unlucky. Nobody gives a rep. So yeah, I'm partially on the fence. I get the complaints, but I also, it's just typical Overwatch victim mentality that really annoys me. Could reading between queue times throw my focus on the, throw my focus uh, off my focus? I'm pretty sorry, doing it. I don't know if I Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's a personal thing. I think there's the sci the science behind it is definitely there, taking your attention away, um, allowing you to kind of relax and refocus your brain and go back into the game next focused. I do know whenever, for example, if I do a seven hour stream <clears throat> um, or an eight hour like scouting stream, uh, around hour five or six, I start to, right? And then I'll, you know, fit, call the stream and then I'll eat, I'll talk with my wife. And I'm like an hour later, I'm like, man, I could, I could do some more scouting, right? It doesn't take me long to like recharge and want to be like, I'm down to work. Now I would only be able to work for like another hour and a half and I'd start to lose focus again. But what you're doing is you're probably increasing your longevity in terms of how much you're able to train without losing focus. It's like anything else. It's like with taking a break between uh, bench press. It's like taking a break between singing rounds. Um, you're giving yourself a little to your body physiologically and, and psychologically to refocus. Um, now, if you're if you're having the problem here is a bit of a hustle laying aside the book, right? Now you're focusing. I want to play first fight. I mean, that could be a little bit of a hustle, but I, I think it's also good to refocus you. So. Um, I don't think it could. It, it's necessarily a bad thing, and in fact, it sounds rather good. Um, but again, it depends on how it works for you. Black by sharp to an extent, yes, but ultimately, it's still training. Is still training. You're still phrasing things as if you're trying to climb an SR when you should just be trying to train. So you don't care if you get unlucky. It doesn't matter if you get unlucky. It shouldn't affect you. What do you think of Jake's brig? Um, I don't think it's very good. I think it's pretty bad. Um, I don't think it's okay. That's not fair for overwatch the extended. It's not very good but He brings his brig isn't a complete throw and he brings a layer of shot calling leadership I'm sure and the outlaws communication that more than compensates for what is lost so Okay, Dallas field and Volsky B defense with versus both the shock and the outlaws double bubble mirror for the most part Both times they defend for five plus minutes seemingly doing the Dallas special taking really aggressive fights bad kill boxes How it works so we actually went over that today and actually the bait is that they were not consistently taking bad fights and bad kill boxes They were actually trading backlines consistently and doing it consistently well So just because they're fighting outside of their backlines LOS doesn't mean it's a bad kill box Necessarily if the enemy tank is also diving in in other words if our backline is set up over here, and like let's say there's a wall right here, okay? And the enemy backline is over here, okay? And we can't see through that. Hey, we can't shoot the backline, right? And the enemy dive tank jumps in on our backline. We don't have to, as a monkey, I don't have to wait to dive the backline on the enemy team until they actually walk into my supports LOS. As long as the enemy tank line is doing something to my backline, I can also return the favor. And because my backline is in a slightly better positioning because they're on a safer high ground, they've got the split set up, et cetera, then I actually get the advantage of the trade. So we talked about in the kill box. The two questions are, um, can we punish them for being there? And are they doing something? And yes, we can punish them over here. It's It'll be hard to consistently, like instantly one-shot people, but you can pressure them. And they are doing something. That monkey is inside of us. We need, he, he's actively threatening my backline, so it's absolutely normal for us to do that. So that's one thing about the kill box thing. Um, from what I saw of the Dallas Fuel, they were very good at patiently trading backlines and holding high ground. They did a really good job with that on Volskaya B defense. Um, so that, that was my... Uh, I didn't watch the Outlaws one, so I would have to like hold my tongue on that one. But for, for the Shock, it was definitely Shock was very unimaginative with the rotations, terrible rotations. They wasted a ton of ultimates and Dallas just were good at the fundamentals. Wait, Brig isn't brainless? No, <laughs> not at all. Uh -huh. um, in your opinion, how challenging do you think it is to play another role in overwatching contenders? Very challenging. Um, 
the big thing that helps players is the fact that they already have a good fundamental understanding of the concepts of professional overwatch and they can carry them over for example um I can confidently say you guys could probably give me two or three weeks, maybe a little longer, and I could probably be a master's main tank on at least like Winston and Ryan because I already kind of know those heroes um, mechanically. Even though I've I've only got to, I got to masters years ago, uh, I, I'm probably like plat at best right now. But because I have such a really good understanding of the game and I know how to practice, I could get to masters in a couple in probably three or four weeks at latest. Um, and it's the same thing with other players, like picking up other roles. They have the game knowledge, they don't have the mechanics, but then they know also even know how to, they know how to train mechanics and then they go and rep it, they bring that game knowledge in and they provide value right away. Um, so game knowledge is really helpful. And then also the traits that helps the most of being a flexible player is just the raw communication. Uh, raw communication and raw mechanics. Like a, a, a player with phenomenal Hanzo aim is also probably gonna have pretty good McCree aim as well. Uh, not to the same level, but mechanics do transfer over. Um, some mechanics like Winston Primal, Tracer Blinks, that is kind of an out there, but in terms of like raw clicking, that, that stuff carries over, even from projectile to hit scan, hit scan to projectile. Not perfectly, but it does carry over. Um, uh, but raw mechanics and communication, game knowledge, those things are obviously transferable to an extent. Big talk, let's see it. Screw that. I'd have to spend like three or four hours a day playing main tank and ranked overwatch. No, thank you. I don't even play three or four hours of overwatch a week, much less a day. Black buy sharp. I mean, it's up to you. Goals are goals. I, I never like setting uh, the, the ends justify the means kind of a thing. Uh, that makes no sense. I never like set the, the, the goal as the goal. I set more of like the, the path to the goal, you know, like it's like kind of like the old Eastern philosophy, right? The goal is to improve, not, not to climb, right? The goal isn't to get to masters. The goal is to get better at the game. And then masters may or may not come as a result. But if it, if it's on, if it works for you, whatever, do it. No, I'm not doing it. I'm too much of a sissy. Are you kidding me? Um, how do I prevent tilt during a game as I see frustrating things? If the first thing things that you see are your own play, then don't beat yourself up. Don't worry about it. Focus on your goals that you need to worry, that you need to be executing on, and then screw the rest. If you're frustrated at your teammates doing stupid things, then you're the same rank as they are. So you're making just as many mistakes as they are. So let's focus on you making mistakes. It always comes back down to taking advantage and taking responsibility for your own play. Like, this is how it is, you know? They're doing something that you're not. That's all it is. You always have the most tilting game? Yeah, I can tell. How do I make a training routine? How many hours should a VOD review or play to come to improve? So very, very basic structured training review, I would say is uh, probably 15 to 20 minute warm up. You can do a little shorter on days when you, when you can't do it as long. Uh, a little longer when your days feel slow. And then I would aim for, I mean, it depends on how much you want to improve. I would aim for at least three to four ranked games. If you want to casually improve, you could probably get to diamond with three or four ranked games a day. Um, it would be hard to get higher than diamond with uh, this. Um, and then between your queues, probably 10 to 15 minutes of review a day. Uh, and I'm talking like, look over a couple team fights, then go do some FFA while you're waiting. You know, look over that one Anubis defense so you didn't know where to position. Oh, how is my cooldown usage there? Um, and you don't even have to do it every day. Like a lot, I know a lot of people I know over, especially people that are like a little over eager, they over review. Uh, you don't need to be over reviewing. Like I, I never, when I was improving, I never reviewed for more than like an hour and a half a week, right? An hour a week. Sometimes I'll do like a 30 minute review here and there. Sometimes I wouldn't do anything, you know, so people often over review. Don't, it's not, it's not that important. QP is a good warm-up? No, I don't, because QP, like, ranked is great in competitive training, but ranked in itself isn't always the greatest warm-up because your instances of mechanical challenge are few and far between. Same thing goes for quick play. So that's why you do your arcade FFA. That's why you can do your custom games. Now, bot, now I used to not like custom games with bots, but bot and like the, the uh, workshop, these bots are so intelligent. Like they move like really realistically. I think I, I don't mind them anymore. I think uh, try hard FFA, deathmatch, uh, aim, 
uh, uh, what is it, the Aim Arena and the Havana map that you can do with other players. Uh, the AI with the Hanzo bots and Genji bots and Tracer bots, I think that's totally fine. Uh, that's, again, constant, constant, constant mechanical challenge. That's what you want with your warm-up. And ultimately, your warm-up is very sneakily improving your mechanics. Your warm-up isn't just for warm-up, especially if you do it for longer than 10 to 15 minutes. It is actually helping your mechanics. It is improving your mechanics. So you need a challenge there, though. And uh, QP is like not enough happens mechanically. Um, long queues, uh, not longer long queues, but like, like, in rank, you're going to be dead, and in spawn, you want to avoid that when you're warming up. Okay, uh, I used to be a 4.4 main support, top two, three, 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 two year break from game, I've only come back predictably. I'm struggling a little bit, especially when compared to how I used to play. Aside from grinding mechanics, not learning the theory of the game, is there anything that comes to mind? Anything of an efficient unwashing process? Your share as a short focus positions. Um, yeah, I mean, shorter focus sessions. Make sure you have a good VOD review schedule. Uh, make sure that you're consistent with your training. Um, try and uh talk like i would build up a network if i could not nothing complicated but try and find a couple people message some contenders players uh message some tier three. Oh, i know this one guy he played 4.5 for so and so astro esports message message him ask him sit down and talk just ask a couple of questions uh if you're in a 4.2 lobby and you got funny astro on the enemy team study his pov take some notes right um that's the kind of stuff that you need to be doing uh, um, playing a new account. I mean, it depends on how much lower. I mean, going your main account is going to suck dropping, but it also might be what you need to do because it, it seems like you're avoiding the issue. Like you're gonna be bad. That's okay. You you just need you, you need to be pursuing what's actually gonna improve you the most, not what's gonna be the easiest. So maybe you just play your main and you get smoked for four or five games. You drop about 200 SR and then, uh, you know, you move from there. But I, I don't know that avoiding your main account is going to be a good idea. But don't this. This is a red flag to me because it's not just about your mechanics. It's going to be about your cooldown usage. It's going to be about your positioning. It's going to be about your game sense. And that stuff is going to need to be improved. And that's going to get better through giving yourself some goals, reviewing your own gameplay and occasionally looking at a player that's better than you and learning from them as well. It is a vague question. I hope that's helpful. You think high level Overwatch has moved away from eco fights and generally usually uh, delay if I learn to have an ultimate in any fight? Um, to an extent, yeah. I think, I think here's, 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 so I came away a couple months ago. I don't know if it was a couple months ago or like a month and a half, two months ago, whatever. A couple months ago. And I said, I don't believe in dry fights, <laughs> theoretically. My thought is this, I don't mind if we look at this fight and say, guys, we're gonna lose this fight probably, so let's not use ultimates. But psychologically, we should still be doing our best to win the fight. We should be trying to clutch it. We should be trying to do something creative or clever that might out force us, the enemy team's ultimates out. So a lot of teams with the eco fight kind of turn off brain, we just lose this next fight. And I think that she needs to go, that needs to die. Um, because I think it's psychologically and strategically makes no sense. You should be trying to win every single fight. However, I don't think, and I do think also like, yeah, you can definitely manage to delay and farm up an ultimate. I think that in Overwatch has improved. Um, but honestly, outside of that, do you think teams staying too long looking for clutches, respawn fight turns these days? Uh, I, I don't know. You'd have to give me some examples, um, but it's, it's hard to get a macro read on like, trends and the professional overwatch scene without like actually like watching every single game and studying every single game and i don't i don't know about that i feel like that's where statistics might actually come into play but i don't even know what stat you need to actually read that um hey sleepy hearts question if your team is playing dice and your support is low mobility dive 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 <laughs> so confused and your support is low mobility like a zen or ana would it be wrong for the high mobility flankers to peel for the support or should they focus on getting kills in the enemy backline um so what they can do is they if the enemy team has flankers your flankers can fight the enemy flankers and they will win because your zen or ana will help the enemy flankers more than the more than like the moira or lucer in the enemy team comp like for example like if i'm playing zen 
and enemy team is running like Brig, Ana, or Lucio, or Moira, my flanker is better than yours because my flanker has Harmony Orb and my flanker has Discord and he will beat the enemy Tracer. He will beat the enemy Ball. He will beat the enemy Sombra or Genji. And so you can use that by peeling, not by, they jump on my support. Let's shoot the monkey. That's not, eh, eh. Genji's not good at that. Tracer's not good at that. Sombra's not good at that. Um, but what you can do is the high mobility flankers can actively duel the Winston before he even dives. Actively duel the Tracer before she even dies. Actively duel the Genji before he even dives. So you can kind of like, it's a preventative mindset, right? By actively dueling and not only dueling to protect your Zen, but because you're actually really good at dueling with Discord and Harmony. Like those are the best duel tools in the game, right? Um, and then obviously if the enemy team does have an also very squishy backline, you can kill the backline as well. Uh, what was bad about FD God's B at the end of Eichenwald attack? They were not, I remember this, they were not actively, if I remember correctly, they were not actively threatened. And I think it would have been, it would have been better for them to actually aggress the fight to go and then we beat. So it was like a beat and then we're aggressing, but we're not really in any danger. So like you want beat to either counter enemy aggression like a nano blade or a grab, or we're going to aggress on you with beat, but I'm not going to beat until we're literally on top of you and we're starting to die. Oh no, we're half HP beat. And we just go right back to full again. It almost baits the enemy team a little bit and it allows you to min max your aggressive duration, right? You use some of your real HP and then you get fake HP. And then by the time the fake HP is down, your real HP is back to heal, uh, healed up again, if that makes any sense. So I if I remember correctly, it was a little too early. Unlucky. How is the core supposed to play in Ball Sorry, when compared to a Ball Sigma? Um, the core can play a little more aggressively because there are bubbles on the table. Um, the, the big the big value of the Ball Sorry is more of enabling your ball though. And it's less about um, backline ed enabling and backline adjustments. It's actually a little worse for the backline because uh, you lose a lot of spam and it can make rotations a little more awkward as well because you don't have a shield. The big thing for the Ball Sorry is, the uh, sorry, is that you can actually enable your ball to go in hard. Um, and sometimes you'll see things like Ball Zarya more against like McCre enemy McCrees or enemy Anas or enemy like, for example, Brig Ana McCree, not having a, a ball or a Zarya for your ball is brutal. We talked about this earlier. If you get bash slept or stunned as ball against a Cree Brig Ana, you're going to get chain CC'd. Just one sleep dart and you're dead. One flash and you're going to get that flashed and then slapped and then bat and you're dead. So you need that bubble a lot of times. Um, so how's the core supposed to play? Probably a little more aggressively. Um, in the Ball Zarya mirror, you have to be very careful about grav. So that's something that you have to keep in mind, grav pulse. So saving bubbles, adjusting your positioning. So sometimes we'll see like Briggs split off to avoid getting grabbed from the Zarya. Um, but yeah, a lot of people talk about like, oh, bubble backline. That doesn't actually happen all that much because it's more important that you bubble your ball in and usually Briggs in plus personal bubble body blocking with Zarya is enough to peel off a ball tracer engage on the enemy team. Do you as Diva dive with the ball? Um, that's extremely compositionally dependent because Diva is so mo flexible with her positioning. You can do both very easily, unlike a Zarya or Sigma. Um, so it's 100% dependent on what you're playing against. And I think you see Ball Diva more against weird compositions and less against normal. So you, I would never see a Ball Diva against a Ball Zarya or a Ball Diva versus a Ball Sigma. Or uh, maybe you'd see Ball Diva versus Double Bubble, but it'd be like weird spam, um, Double Shield, maybe Farah, maybe Double Bubble. Yeah, and then it would just depend on what you're playing into. But if you're playing D.Va, it's less so for backline peel and probably more because you've got a really aggressive off-angle DPS, some sort, some form of spam. Maybe you play D.Va if you're really struggling with a rotation, so you need like full matrix. But that's a, that's a good question though. Okay, what warm do you recommend when there are no FFA lobbies for DPS players? Uh, a Marina, or you need to find SATA codes, or not SATA codes, but like warm up lobbies with uh, bots, like Ana bots, Genji bots that move more realistically. I don't know of any, I don't have any, but there will be plenty out there, I promise you. Can you explain why the Talon Dive has been beating the current Brawl? I don't think it has been. 
Uh, I'm not aware of Talon Dive being purposefully run against Brawl and consistently successfully beating it. If you guys have any VODs or replay codes or fights where it is, uh, I would be shocked um, if it did. And if it did, it's a major, major screw up from the Brawl team. But Talon Dive is not there to be, not designed in any way, shape, or form to beat Brawl. It is an unfavorable matchup. It is there to beat spam comps with Zins, and it's there to beat sloppy double bubble, uh, or a double bubble that doesn't have map control, because it can just run it over before it can get like high ground and ultimates. Because once ultimates and positional advantage gets rolling, Talon Dive struggles. It doesn't play against Brawl Age Light. It just doesn't. The only way you can beat Brawl with Talon Dive is somehow play around high grounds with your Sombra and somehow farm up a Coalescence and get a crucial hack. Uh, or maybe the McCree splits too far. Maybe you get a hack on a D.Va and you can rush the BAP. The only way you beat Brawl is you have to like all in and hopefully kill BAP or Kree with a hack on a D.Va. But it is a rough matchup. It is a very rough matchup. How should you play a Brawl versus Brawl as Ryan where the enemy comp has a Doom playing frontline and you have a Mei? Doom punches you, you absorb it, he doesn't do anything, you wall them, and then they die. If you don't, if neither team does anything in terms of folk, they also die because you have significantly higher spam than they do. Um, but mostly it's about forcing that Doom to engage, surviving the Doomfist engage, and then beating the crap out of them afterwards. Um, if you know the Doomfist is like staging or doesn't have cooldowns, you don't even have to wait. You can just go in and run them over. Doomfist comp is, is it looks like this. Very strong, pretty, pretty weak. May comp is like this. Strong with wall, but also still pretty strong without wall. And it's these spikes here. You see how much harder that spike is with Doomfist? Doomfist goes, like we could do it like this. Doomfist comp punches, and then he's very weak after that. With May comp, Doomfist comp punches, he's very weak, and then you may wall, and then you and then you this is where you fight. So right after Doomfist goes in. Yeah, it could it could theoretically work. It could theoretically work. It, it, the only way that it's gonna require a, 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 an open map with a lot of flanks though to beat Brawl. Um, a lot of flanks and a lot of high ground, if possible. Um, flanks, open uh, flanks, and 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 high ground is a good way you could theoretically beat uh, brawl. Like for example, Volsky Industries second defense, you could theoretically beat brawl with Talon Dive there with a number of flanks and high ground available. It wouldn't be easy, but you could theoretically do it. Um, why am I getting pinged ten times? Talon, mostly Talon characters. Sombra, Moira, Reaper. Because it was originally run with Reaper Sombra. Some teams run Sombra Tracer. Tracer is better against um, spam. But I, I find Reaper to be better against other dive. Because your, your Tracer doesn't get armor packs or orb, so she's kind of vulnerable. Uh, I purposely avoid placing comp a few days after season starts in order to avoid playing against Overwatch League players, and I purposely avoid playing comp at any season to avoid throws. But because of this, I go a long time without playing comp, and I only scram in this period. I want to grind, but I don't want to run to little pros or have throws. I know going long pace without playing comp is a good one. What should I do? I mean, what do you think you should do? Do you, do you like want me to spell it out? Play comp, you moron. There is just as likely that like like you're gonna benefit from Overwatch League players, you're gonna suffer against Overwatch League players. You're gonna benefit from throwers, you're gonna suffer against like throwers. Like the, you're you're literally saying, "Hey, Coach Spilo, I sit on my bottom all day long. I don't do anything at all. What should I do?" Well, I don't know. Like you tell me. You're you're reinforcing this this habit. You know it's bad, and until you actually break the cycle, it's not gonna happen. And I'm just not a therapist. I'm not smart enough to be able to tell you psychologically. I can give you some advice. I would say you, you can avoid playing early in the season, but you have to start playing later in the season. Start with just a couple games, you know, force yourself, set yourself goals. Like I'm, I know I'm really scared at the start of the season, but I'm going to, for this week, I'm going to play at least one game a day or two games a day. Start small, you know, like uh, ex hopefully extinct that phobia of yours. But uh, I mean, you know what the answer, you know the answer. 
I'm a low master's main tank, did a spreadsheet, and as a general trend, wow, okay. Whenever I get placed at 3.7 lobbies, I usually win. When I get 3.1 lobbies, I lose. They seem to cancel out my win rate. What do you think it might be causing this? How can I adapt? Well, first off, I would have to see what's the sample size, because that might be interesting, but it might be the sample size is like, hey, it's 14 games. That's like, I mean, that's doesn't really, you don't really know. It could just be random. Um, but also could be that, um, I don't know, maybe you're playing differently. Who, who knows? Honestly, honestly, couldn't tell you. It could be a million things. How can you adapt? I don't know. Go back and look at your own replay codes. Do you play worse? Do you feed more? Do you die more often? Do you think that you could be getting more value? Like, are you making more mistakes in your diamond lobbies? Are you putting expectations on diamond players that aren't there? Like, oh, I expect my team to just heal me and just go in without actually being aware of where they are or what they're doing. Who knows? My team, okay, I gotta drink some water, boys. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting toasted. We're almost there, chat, almost there. Ah. Almost 40 questions. Okay. My team has a problem in Brawl that we have a game plan at the beginning that we decently execute, but we often lose target focus mid-fight and are all over the place and our position gets pretty bad pretty quickly. What do we do to fix this issue? With target focus, um, you can work on something called echoing where different people echo the tar initial target call and you can also have designated mid-fight target callers. So in other words, you can have a Zarya, your Winston, your main tank, your, your flex DPS, your flex support, whoever is more comfortable calming and whoever makes sense in the composition. You kind of find a balance between those two variables and have somebody who's the designated mid-fight target caller. Everybody shuts up and listens to them mid-fight or, or even echoes their call. Um, so that, that can help. And a position gets pretty bad pretty quickly as well. I mean, again, without context, I don't really know what you mean. Uh, does your backline just get really sloppy with their positioning? Well, that's a separate issue with your backline. Your backline needs to sort that out. Does your tank just dive in without actually checking whether your tracer is set up and then he feeds? Well, then he needs to be talking with his tracer more. So this is a team issue. This is not necessarily and probably not a team issue. If all of your positioning gets bad, that means that there's probably a lot of individual mistakes that need to be cleaned up. Okay, um, Coach Prescott. Hey, Coach. As a coach, I'm constantly trying to grow my knowledge and strategic understanding of the game. What are some effective ways to go about building up a deep understanding of the game? For myself, I'm a GM DPS player, but Diamond and Tank support. How can I build a deep understanding of the game, team play, and often without becoming GM top five owner of all of us? Study Overwatch League replay codes. Take notes. How do they position? How do they use their cooldowns? Uh, how do they play against different compositions? What are their, how, uh, how do they, uh, if you can get access, um, I don't know what lo who, what l lobbies or tiers you coach, but if you have anybody that coaches like a 4.2, 4. .2, 4 like, I don't know what tier, tier you coach, but find a couple tiers above where you coach right now and see if you can sit on a lobby or in a VOD review. If you have any buddies, uh, if you have any friends at all, I'm just kidding. Um, and there may be another college at a higher rank that would be willing to like let you like listen in. If you can get any access from high level Overwatch League coaching um, in here, big brain content, there's a couple of uh, people, um, Spilo approved partners. Let me look through here. Um, Thor's got some good stuff. You can check out Thor. Um, Ego's Cat has some great stuff. Uh, Hayes has some good stuff. Temporal has a lot of good stuff as well. Some team VOD reviews that he's streamed. Um, so I recommend checking those out. You can do your own research. But like I said, Overwatch League replays, find, uh, talk with other uh, coaches that might be interested in like listening in their VOD reviews. I try and always go shoot higher. Um, and also understand that it's better to be a good coach at the fundamentals than it is to know all the little tiny little details. I unironically, and I still have them, had word documents for every single hero where i put every single little tip and trick that i had learned about a hero and i'm talking about like against zarya bubble you on a nade after bubble not before right i'm talking about like legitimately ridiculously number of details that just i, I just and i would keep it in a word document and I, i'm grateful i did it and I, I would recommend others to do it as well but also it wasn't a huge return on investment right a lot of the details just didn't matter. I forgot a lot of them. A lot of them got outdated as times would change. Um, and some of them I remember, but that that ultimately isn't like what made me a better coach. It was the communication, the team building, the basics, the fundamentals of positioning and, and timing and communication and just being a good, decent guy that like helped my players improve. And it was encouraging. Those, that's more important to me. Okay. Um, and I hope that's somewhat helpful. I wasn't answering it. Honestly, there's not a lot. It's better now than it used to be, but there isn't a ton of good knowledge, strategic content out there. Some of it's out there. Um, a lot of it, I think, is just wildly overrated. 
Um, you can definitely check out people like I know Custa does VOD reviews. I think he, he's okay. McGravy is okay. They're a little shallow, but they are appealing more to a more casual audience. Um, but yeah. Peter Roy, my team recently played double shield, double sniper in Jungle Town against a brawl team. We held them for five minutes. Who held us for five minutes at the entrance tunnel to the high ground on point B? How would you suggest trying to break this choke? Holy smokes. That's challenging. Um, you need to basically take a bunch, take deep angles, take a couple of dry fights. So we talked about dry fights, how I don't want to take dry fights. Well, don't take dry fights. Try and flank with your widow and int and and maybe get a 3k on a flank, you know, and you're gonna have to save up an old mink. Because the way certain comps work is because the sidelines are so short when they're holding a tight choke, if you don't have a way of opening up angles, which on that point, it's pretty hard, um, then you just have to build up an old thing and brute force it out. So you still take angles, you still take flanks, you get your flux, you get your bongo, you get your trance, you get your window, you get your dragon ult, and you're like, all right, guys, here we go. Flank your widow, flux out the choke, force beat, trance, Hold your space, then you're gonna bungle, and then you're gonna drag it on top of the brawl team, and then they're gonna blizzard you, and then your BAP's gonna window for like you're gonna have to blow everything. And you're gonna hopefully like have to out ult them and have more ults than they do. Um, and then the next fight, you will have your angle set up, you'll have map control, and brawl will have to run into you, and that's kind of what you want to do. Uh, I keep seeing a lot of teams play Sigma and Rush comms even on closer inch maps like Oasis University. Why Sigma instead of Diva and how does that affect how the comp plays? So anywhere where the high ground isn't super relevant, there's not a lot of angles and flanks and or there's longer sightlines, Sigma is going to be played a little more often, especially with teams that are more comfortable with Sigma. Now, I do know there's a couple of other, other micro reasons why teams might play Sigma instead of Diva. Um, uh, Matrix on ping can be a little wonky. Um, it is a little easier in some ways. Uh, teams also, there's not a lot, there's some teams that don't have great divas, but they have good sigmas. That's another thing to keep in mind. But for example, Oasis University, relatively short range map. So you're thinking diva, but then also the high grounds are a little limited and not super relevant, at least where the kill box usually is. So sigma can kind of stand in the off angle and spam, 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 and there's consistent value. Um, with the other thing I will mention as well is that in general, in Overwatch League metas and just pro metas in general, the tempo usually slows down a little bit as teams get better and better at kiting and dealing with just raw aggression. And so heroes that are more attuned to fighting at that slower tempo and get more value at the slower tempo, like a spammier hero like Sigma, generally get more value. Now, the it's not just the tempo, because you guys know I hate that word. It's also the fact that the Sigma is better at controlling the non high grunt angles. So that there's your answer. Okay. Jax is the main support player. When I VOD review myself, what should I be looking for? Both in scrim setting and a comp setting. How can I make sure that my position postponing that my positioning is on oh, my place at time. I mean, that's a ridiculously general question. Ask yourself, could I have positioned better in this, in this, is there a better positioning for than I, where I was at that given moment in time? Was that a good amp? Was that a good Valk? Could I have done it earlier? Could I have done it later? Should I have done it at all? Was I pocketing the right person? And, and literally just ask yourself question after question for every cooldown that you use in every single that you position. And if the answer is I could not have done any better, then fine. If maybe I could have, then stop and think about it. Learning is work. People come to me for early, easy answers, but ultimately taking what I, I give you and actually applying it, that's work. You have to think about it. Sometimes I've had problems with my teams or with my coaching or with my game launch where I had to go upstairs and sit in the shower for 10 minutes because I didn't know the flipping answer. And I knew the game and I couldn't figure it out. And I had to sit there and think and think and think and think and I finally came up with a solution. I figured it out, right? At least I thought so. And it's the same thing for you. So I don't know what rank you are, I don't know who you play or what heroes that you're talking about, but there, you need, to, you need to look at your play, you need to ask yourself, could I have done better here or positioned better here or done something smarter here? And go do it, go do it, go try it. You're not sure? Ask somebody smarter than you. Ask somebody better than you. Or go try it out and see if it works. But there's no shortcuts to this stuff. It takes a little work, you know? Thinking is work, my dad used to always say, and boy was he right. I spectated Void versus the Dallas Fuel Nose at some point, specifically 450 Kings during Grand Finals. We used a lot of DM on general spam through window. Fleta died when Fearless Fire Strike through it. What is that in mind? Is it worth to hold your DM for very specific cooldowns and window scenarios? Mainly thinking Fire Strike, I guess. It was a great idea. So, yes, sometimes, but most players generally are going, in my opinion, you should win Matrix the early onset of window 
the first, you know, probably use two thirds, three quarters of your matrix, whatever. If you don't have much left, use whatever you've got. And then after that, yeah, you can selectively matrix fire strikes. But honestly, at that point, if somebody's getting window fire striked three seconds or four seconds into the window, that's on them. So that sounds like that's just on Fleta. Like Fleta should not be dying to a window fire strike like after the window's been up for several seconds. So that's not really Void's fault, no. I mean, you could matrix that, but I don't necessarily, I like, you shouldn't have to. You should be able to recharge your matrix for after window. Uh, Hinya, I made the level of analysis doc to start to work towards goals in game, like pushing micro hero interactions, different POV understandings, and a general macro to the highest level. The issue here, because I overthink a lot, I can constantly have really expectations that I never meet or fall just over short periods of time. This is also a stress thing where I feel like I need to be better every second, which comes down to my questions now of how can I properly set consistent goals within reasonable time frames of Overwatch? Well, you're already screwing up. And I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest with you. You're already screwing up. Um a level of analysis doc with micro hero interactions, different POV understandings, and general macro to the highest level. I assume that's what you're talking about when it comes to your play or your own improvement and your own goals, because that's way too much. That could be interesting if you're learning the game just to learn it, or you're learning the game to coach it, or you're giving that information and utilizing it for a team. But even that is too much for like a team. You have to break it down. And you certainly got to break it down to an individual standpoint if that's what you're doing for yourself. So you can use these documents, but then you have to do a very important P word, okay? Prioritize. I can't even spell it right. Prioritize. You have to look at all that crap and you got to go, okay, what's going to have the biggest impact on my play? Or what do I think is the most important one to improve upon? Whether that's a, a hero interaction that you're constantly struggling with, like in a brawl meta, maybe you're a Ryan player. I'm constantly getting Maywall. I need to start practicing baiting Maywalls, right? Maybe that's 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 uh that's uh relevant right now. Maybe it's uh we're, it's a Zen tracer meta. Okay, I need to do a better job tracking tracer positioning, right? That's fine. That's a micro hero interaction, but it maybe it has impact to you a lot. Uh, you know, maybe it's macro positioning, POV understanding, whatever. And again, I assume that's what you're talking about, but your problem is you. Is, is you're not you're thinking oh i overthink these things well yeah no crap sherlock when you're writing like flipping like essays and thesis on the game of overwatch and what your improvement needs to be that's like saying you know i i i i you know i spent hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours cleaning my bedroom okay and then i get this then afterwards i think about it and i go man Maybe I'm maybe I'm overdoing it. Yeah, no crap. Like you're 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 putting putting effort into something that's screwing yourself over. If you're really that concerned about overthinking things or falling short of your expectations, then don't set the bar so high, right? We talked about this just a second ago with the Coach Prescott question. How are these big documents where I went over a lot of different micro details, and a lot of those little details just didn't have a lot of impact on myself as a coach. They were helpful sometimes, but overall not so much, and even more so for you even more so for you. So, so streamline, prioritize, and then don't beat yourself up over it. Give yourself, simplify, streamline what you need to work on significantly. One or two things, tops. And track your progress at that. Instead of taking your effort and making an analysis doc on all the million things of Overwatch, let's make an analysis doc of your of your day-to-day -day improvement and your day-to-day -day training at specific set things. Take your skill set in that regard and apply it to simplifying and streamlining and tracking those levels, those different aspects of improvement. All right. What does K dive do better than Sigma Doll? Uh, Sigma Ball, oh, Korean Dive. Better Brawl, better in short sightlines. I think the backline of Sigma Ball is more oppressive than the backline of Korean Dive. Um, I mean, it is if you can get the space for your Zen. Struggle, some, a lot of teams struggle to get space for the Zen, especially if they're on attack and or in Koth in a short sightline map. Sigma plays better with the backline than Zarya. I mean, but also Sigma can't peel for himself, and so he demands a lot of resources. Zarya can't generally bubble backline. We talked about this, but she can bubble herself, and that provides a lot of, uh, of value. And Sigma Shield isn't that useful against Winston, Tracer, and Neko. It's somewhat useful, but it's not as useful, especially considering the cooldown change in the, in the last uh, six months or so. Uh, it's just anywhere where there's a shorter sightline. 
It's going to be more valuable to have Winston Cleave. It's going to be more valuable to have Anti Nade and Nano. I mean, this is just, it's just a hero matchup here, right? You've got heroes that are better in short sight lanes and better than heroes that are in long. And when you nerf things like Discord, when you nerf things like uh, Ball Boop, when you nerf things like Tracer Fall Off, so the amount of spam that a Tracer can put at range, um, and nerf things like, uh, what was the other one? Oh, Sigma Shield cooldown. There's a little tiny little nerfs that chipped away at it. And then all of a sudden you've got the brawlier style compositions, whether it's actual raw brawl or double bubble, they're just going to outperform it. Um, Korean dive, I believe is double bubble. I think that's what we're going for here. Would fear say that if we're playing a dive into Sigma ball, we should just force a brawl and win the brawl. Yes, you should force a brawl with angles from your tracer or echo or sombra. But yes, you need to force an up close brawl while taking as little damage as possible to get there. Right, because if they can whittle you down, and that's how Briggs End beats Korean Dive, is to open up angles and spam you out, so that when you do dive, you're already half HP. You're down your you're, you're down your Winston Bubble or whatever. But that is how you beat it. You do need to get up close and personal with your Zarya Brig Ana Winston, and have a pincer from your from your DPS. Yeah, that is how you're gonna you will destroy Sigma Briggs End if you get on top of it safely. Winston will annihilate that with a bubble. Um, there's a weird grounds well. What? What does grounds well mean? You're in chat, right? No comprende. I, I don't want to even start reading the question because I feel like I'm going to be on the wrong foot. <laughs> I'll give you a couple seconds and then I'm just going to try and figure it out. I feel like I need a Rosetta Stone for this one. Google. Wait, is that an actual word? Ground swell. Ground swell. Ground swell. Is that a real thing? Oh, all right. I'm learning. Ground swell is a sudden gathering of force as of public opinion. Brilliant. Okay. Now you're. F See, I'm used to flexing my uh, my uh, vocabulary and you plebeians, but uh, okay. All right, all right. I'll give credit where credit is due. All right, there's a weird gr movement, growing movement, groundswell. Brilliant. Where people like Samito are recommending QP for learning mechanics because of better Q times. I mean, why would you practice? Oh, gosh. Where you're going to be? No, no, no. Absolutely not. Go, like, why would you play quick play when you can literally die, instant respawn, instantly mechanically challenge over and over and over again in deathmatch? Horse manure. Thoughts compared to comp? Horse manure. Comp is way more competitive in terms of like actually learning the game because people are trying a lot more and there's a more realistic situation, right? So if you actually want to get good at the game, you play comp. If you want to get good at just raw mechanics, grind deathmatch or aim arenas or whatever, there is nothing to compare. Samito is needs to, I don't know what he needs to do. He needs to take some vitamins, a multivitamin, and get some sleep because he's completely wrong. Are the game still more focused and dedicated in comp? Yes. Even with Q times. Yes. Heck, if you're really concerned about Q times, guess what you could be doing during Q times? You could be doing deathmatch. <laughs> you can do comp and then if you're really, then min mag, you can literally do comp, deathmatch, comp, deathmatch, comp, deathmatch, and literally have maximize your mechanical and overall aspects of your training. Crazy, crazy to me. I don't understand how people can uh, can have opinions like that. I'm I'm kind of kidding. I'm kind of, just so we're clear. I'm, I'm not actually molding. It's not that big of a deal. Uh -uh. All right.